Well, it's a pleasure to be with you all today, and I think I'm finding out why Kurt invited me on Mother's Day. <laughs> well, I was thinking, should I speak from a mother's perspective or two mothers, right? And that's the key, right? Well, um, yes, I am a mother. Uh, my name is Karen, as Kurt has said before, and I'm pleased to be a mother of three. My husband made it all possible. He's over there sitting, my husband, Walter. <coughs> I always thank him today because um, um, God through him made me a mother of three beautiful children. We have Kevin who's 20, almost 21, uh, and who's a third year in college in computer engineering at Cal State Long Beach and we're blessed with this child um, that we prayed for for a long time. And uh, we have Daniel who's 18 and who'll be graduating high school this year. And we have Nina and who's 14 and starting high school. So I'm a mother of an almost adult and two teenagers, and they keep me on my toes. They remind me that I am their mother every day. Uh, but uh, as Kurt said before, I got away from them, actually, and only came with my husband. They're actually, <laughs> uh, we're members of Rolling Hills Covenant Church in Espanol, and so I get to serve there along with Pastor Melvin Ardon, um, and uh, they're actually serving, all three, uh, they serve in different uh, ways at church. And so I'm, I'm pleased that they are finding their way to ministry in their own context, which is what I prayed for as a mother. So I'm blessed because of that. Um, well, aren't we blessed? Aren't we blessed? Yes. Blessed because God in his amazing love gave us his word. And this word today um, is probably going to make, and, and that's why I said, Kurt, you know, he had it all planned along, because um, you've been studying three be uh, the Beatitudes, and uh, three of the Beatitudes that, we've, that you've talked before, it's about our need, right? About our desperate need, our position as followers of Christ. And so this morning, we'll be learning about the fourth one, and actually that takes a turning point in the series. So maybe you want to sit comfortably because it's going to make you feel uncomfortable, um, hopefully, as the Holy Spirit talking, um, because as we do our review, blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit. And being poor in spirit is that acknowledgement that before God, we simply do not have what it takes. Have you ever felt that way? That simply we just don't have it all together. And I think this is the reality that we've experienced in this season, that we just don't have it all together, right? And this is the kind of reality that it's a part of our private life, <clears throat> but it's also part of our public life with God. It is your intimate life with God, but that actually uh, is expressed in how you relate to others, in that acknowledgement that in, in our smallness, we see and we are in awe of his greatness. Isn't it great? Isn't it great that he has kept us safe? And in the midst of loss, maybe in this season, we see the need of him in us. The second one was, blessed are those who mourn. Now, why would, why would I mourn? Why would Jesus tell us that to live kingdom life it is to, and, and to be blessed is to be, uh, to be mourning? Well, actually, we should mourn because... We sin a lot, aren't we? Don't we? And that should be a reason of mourning, because we sin. And that, it has, that has a cost, isn't it? And today we're going to be reminded of that cost. But not only a great cost to Jesus and all his sacrifice that he did, but our sins are also costly to our own lives, but also to those around us. And so we should mourn that. We should be lamenting the fact that our sins hurt us and hurt others. You see, in the process of mourning, uh, we experience that in our lives this season. Um, my coworker um, passed away suddenly on December 30th. And, uh, and it's just this, there's a moment of just feeling numb, right? And that's how sin should make us, feel that numb, that, you know, that part that we just cannot even understand. How do we think or do and take action into that? But the, and two days later, we lost uh, my mother-in-law. And she had been part of our family since I got married to my husband. 
And so we lost a very precious family member, which was part of our lives. And that has taken its own process, right? And that's where I want to take you with that. Number two, blessed are those who mourn. It is a process, a daily process of mourning that our sins hurt us and hurt others. But at the same time, they hurt Jesus Christ when he went on the cross. But we know the end story, right? But that shouldn't be so easy to say, well, you know, we have new life. And that's the part that we live in the broken world. And so every day we still live in this flesh. And the third one was blessed are the meek. Now we grow in meekness because we see that in the midst of those sins, in the midst of our situation and our reality, God doesn't treat me like that. And isn't that great? Blessed are the meek. And in Psalm 103, I'm going to read, um, if you have your Bibles with you, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your inequities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfy you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He has treated us with grace and kindness. That should be a, a, a reason why you should, we should, you should be standing and you should be wailing and jumping because in the midst of our sins, he has treated us with grace and kindness. Isn't that aren't those great news? Those are the news that we should be thinking about every day. Not sometimes the news in the, in the newspapers or, wait, do we actually read newspapers? <laughs> Maybe some of us still do. Actually, our oldest son uh, loves to read newspapers. Um, what could make us happier than this? What could make us happier than the fact that in the midst of our mourning that we sin, God treated us with grace and, and kindness? Now, here's the turning point. You see, the three Beatitudes are about seeing our own position. We see ourselves in there, right? And my hope is that by the end of our time together today, the Holy Spirit convicts us that these fourth Beatitudes should move us. And see, moving takes action. It is a decision that you have to make. It is a desire that it has to grow within you because... You are poor in spirit because you mourn and because you are meek. So let's read Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now in this moment, actually I would like for you to close your eyes and think about that moment in time in your life, one moment maybe, that you are, have actually experienced the most terrible hunger and thirst. And just go back in time, flashback to that moment. And I'll share you about my story. I immigrated to the United States when I was 13. My dad is a covenant pastor in Central California, in Turlock. And um, we experienced war in El Salvador. And uh, for long periods of time, we had no food for certain moments in time. And although God always provided, and we never understood where that provision came from, we knew that it was God using people, using um, sometimes people that believed in him, sometimes people that did not. But that's the power of Jesus. And so I remember those moments that your, act your stomach actually tells you, right? Your body reminds you that you're hungry. Maybe some of you are like that today. So if somebody's growling next to you, just, just you know, we'll have food in a few, in a few moments. <laughs> but see, um, to be hungry and to be thirsty, it's a natural need that we all humans have. And so when God, when Jesus tells us that blessed are those who hunger for righteousness and, and, and thirst for righteousness, because they shall be satisfied. Isn't it great? Now, remember that after that moment that you were hungry and thirsty, 
and that you actually put some food in your stomach and water. What was that feeling like? Just incredible, right? It doesn't water even take sweeter when you drink it after you've been, you've been so thirsty. It's like the, the taste buds, you know, just kind of uh, enhance the, fla- the water flavor. So I would like for us to be reminded in Ecclesiastes 3.11, and it reads like this. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. And when I read this, it was like, what does this mean? Why does God has put eternity into our minds, but yet he hasn't still revealed everything to us? Why? Because there should be this amazing hunger growing up within us. Because if he would reveal everything to us, we would know it all. And sometimes that's how we feel even today, right? Oh, we know it all. We got it. We might, we've made it. And this is a reminder of, of, of the word of God. That he has made beautiful everything in its time. But he has given us that ability to understand that our minds are eternal. Our souls are eternal when we believe in Christ. But yet, he's revealing everything to us in, period, in small periods of time. And I don't know if that happens to you, but it is like a child. <clears throat> when he discovers something new, he wants to know more, right? And the moment that you tell him no, what does he or she do? They actually go for it because they want to know more. And so um, God has given us this ability to, to think beyond but yet we have to trust him of his revelation. So the, uh, Jesus tells us that we should desire this. Now, I think everyone in here has desired something in their lives, right? We, uh, when we immigrated to this country, we desired you know, to live a better life, free of war, free of gunshots and seeing people dead around us or not having enough food to eat. That was a desire. But the term um, righteousness in here, desiring that righteousness and hung, hunger for that righteousness and having thirst for that righteousness, it means a little different. <clears throat> Sometimes righteousness for us means that it has to be right. It's rectitude, right? Sometimes it means imputed righteousness. Sometimes personal righteousness. But in here it means that you are to be dead to your sins. That's what the righteousness in this, in this passage means. And that is, this is the life of the kingdom. It means an, a renunciation of the world. So how could we live in this world and renounce to the things of the world, to the things that make us comfortable, to the things that we desire? That's a very thin line, right? Because uh, we don't want to suffer. We don't want to live in, in poverty. We always want to succeed, and it's great. You know, yesterday I graduated, and that's an accomplishment, but is that the only thing that should satisfy me? That's the question. So we're going to attempt to dig into this gracious statement that we we're going to take possession of what Jesus tells us, that these desires should be satisfied. But it implies that we should also remember the promise that he made us. That after that desire is, 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 is done to us, we will be satisfied. But should that, should that conclusion, should the result of that is what should drive us? Do, uh, do, are we desiring it because we want to be satisfied? That's the question. Because if that's what propels you then righteousness becomes something totally different from what Jesus is telling us here. So we're going to do a test of heavenly citizenship. See, for most of you, um, you were born here, more likely. So as an immigrant, one of our desires was to come to the United States, but also to be part of this country, to live among this country, and be like people who lived in this country. 
But see, I have my own roots, and that makes me different, and I cannot um, put that away because as, long, as much as I have many things that I love about cultures, I still have this desire to be who I am, which is a Salvadorian. So in my home, you know, we, we have all kinds of meals. I love to cook. That's actually my de-stressor. So if you ever, if you ever are around Harbor City, I invite you to my home and, and cook you uh, something uh, that you would enjoy. Actually, I love cooking for people and, and enjoy for them to enjoy what I cook. Um, and although I cook different varieties, there's still something that I desire, which is to teach my children that my roots as a Salvadorian, uh, there are certain foods that I would like for them, to, uh, for them to know the flavors of. And see, that's how I put that in them, because they were not born in El Salvador, but they're still Salvadorian, right? Because it's my husband and I, we're both Salvadorian, so that makes them 100% full-blooded Salvadorian. But they were born in this country with, with, uh, in a different environment that we grew up with. So the ways that I teach them is through food, right? Or telling them my stories. And so to take a test of heavenly citizenship, this is what um, Jesus is calling us for. Because we belong in heaven, we should be thinking about eternity, but the reality is that we live in this earth. The reality is that we live in a broken world. The desire should be that us as Christians should desire righteousness. And this is to live in conformity to God's will, not to ours, because God is righteous. And so as followers of Christ, we should live our lives in personal purity. Now we live in a flesh that goes against that. Every single day. Every single day. As followers of Christ, we should be thinking about what is right. But what is right, according to my perspective, could be very different from your perspective. See, if I had a number six drawn on the floor right now, and I had Kurt standing over there, what would you see, Kurt? You would see a nine, and I would see a six. Now, are we both right? We're both right. But... What I have to do in order for me to see Kurt's perspective is that I have to actually take action and step and walk and go around and be near him and be on his side of the number so I could see that. And that's what Jesus is calling us in here. We have an eternal mindset, but we live in this reality that if we don't actually take action and step into what it takes, then it's going to be more about our righteousness and not about being righteous. You see the difference? It's not about that. And so um, the object of the matter here is that desire part. And see, our desires are totally wrong. Because our flesh, our comfort is what drives us. Is, is the object of being happy. And that's what blessed means, right? Being happy. Being extremely happy. Three times happy. But is that satisfaction of the Christian life? This is, and, this, and that is what should satisfy us. So, heart cravings. Who has cravings in here? Everyone, right? Everyone craves. And see, when we, <laughs> when we think about craving, I think I'm craving a crepe right now. Yeah, with banana and, I, and strawberries and some whipped cream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And see, when I crave something, in order for me to get that, I have to, uh, again, take action. But it starts with my hunger in my tummy. And I'm craving it. As I'm hungry, I'm thinking, oh, that would taste so amazing. That would taste so good. And you actually get up and make it. Or you go to a restaurant and satisfy your craving. Right? So it's that natural appetite. So what Jesus is calling us in here is that desire of the spiritual appetite. So my question to you today is, how is your spiritual appetite? Are you hunger? Are you longing? And what Jesus is calling us here is not to just long to come to church on Sundays and sit comfortably and praise God, 
Maybe you liked the worship songs today. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you liked the preacher today. Maybe you didn't. But see, I only come here once, oh, every once in a while, so. <laughs> but see, why, what, what, what brought you here? What did you came craving when you came here? Why are you longing when you came here, when you walked up to that door? Were you longing to see your friends? Were you longing to see the worship? Were you longing to be part of it? Were you longing to um, whatever that might be? What drove you here? So um, our condition, that hunger and that thirst, is what describes it, Jesus as being righteous. You see, righteousness by God, it means that we have this daily hunger for him. That when we think about our sins, when we think about our condition, which are the first three beatitudes that you've studied, it should move us into this spiritual hunger. It should move us into this spiritual thirst. It should move us into knowing that only Jesus can satisfy it. And so that hunger, that condition of our mind, it actually is an indication of a healthy or not healthy spiritual life, right? And so what, what is it that leads this person to hunger and thirst? It is a dissatisfaction of things, or is it the fact that you want to walk into a satisfied position? And um, when we think about hunger, um, have you ever been so hungry that you actually walk and get, get to serve yourself? And your eyes are actually more hungry than your tummy, right? There is a, mis a disconnection between your eyes and your tummy. And so you grab, you know, you, full, you fill up your plate. And when you actually start eating, you actually, and actually start eating fast, right? Because you're just so hungry that your mind is telling you that you're going to die if you don't feed me. You're going to die if you don't give me water. And so um, you eat and then you might choke. Or actually then start feeling so full that you actually feel sick to your stomach, right? So from that perspective is the fact that we have to do it. It's a process, right? When uh, our children are small, you are, their stomach are small. So you cannot feed them the feast that we feed ourselves into, right? So if, accordingly to their, to their age or to their growth, that's how much they eat and how much they hunger. And so these, the kids, when they are feeling hungry, they express it, right? Oh, boy, do they do that. <laughs> oh, yes, they do. And so their natural way of expressing it is by crying it out. And how, when was your last cry out for food? But when was your last cry out? For Jesus. Can we think about that? That speaks to our, our health or unhealthy spiritual lives. When was that last time that you were actually on the floor and just saying, I cannot get it together. I cannot handle it. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the hungry and the thirst for righteousness. See, um, Hungry, hunger uh, and feeding our hunger delivers us from death, right? Because if we don't eat, we eventually our body starts showing it, right? You become thinner. But you can see it in your eyes. Your, you know, your body is not healthy, right? And so our bodies show it. See, in Psalm 42, 2, let's read there. David says, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? And when was that last time that we felt that way? When was the last time that we actually felt that need, that hungry? You see, it's supposed to be a constant hunger. Uh, so I've been on this healthcare journey for a, the last year, actually. Um, 
the pandemic, I'm a people person, and so I, I, I needed people, but then I also had unhealthy habits. Um, I always thought, oh, no, I'm happy with who I am, and I'm okay like that. And so, um, you know, because I love to cook, that was always my, my uh, and I love feeding my family, so that was always uh, my excuse. <clears throat> but I, I know that food gives me satisfaction, but I wasn't using it properly. And see, that's the problem as well. So when you have food, food is good. It, it, it gives you that satisfaction, but when you don't use it properly, then it can be damaging to my health to those around me. And on top of it, um, you know, we inherit, you know, our genes from our parents, right? And we, you know, can be, we have certain, uh, ten, ten, uh, now I'm thinking in Spanish, <laughs> um, tendencies, yeah, there you go, thank you, uh, to think that, oh, you know, it's not going to happen to me. But because it's there, because we care in our genes, so we have to be conscientious. And so, when, God, when Jesus tells us to be hungry and, and thirsty for righteousness, see, to, to be constantly satisfied in order to, for me to be healthy, I have to eat a small meal every three hours, right? You know, sometimes you think that when you um, uh, don't eat, then you're going to get thinner. But no, your body needs constant food. So it's, this, it's to feel this constant fullness that um, God's, God's fullness is what I'm talking about. That overflowing and ever-flowing grace that he has with us. Um, and that hungry should be constant. It should not be just the hunger here on Sundays, you know, at 10 in the morning uh, uh, or 10, 9.30. Um, <clears throat> but it should be that. It's to have that soul starvation. And now, um, we sang the song and Kurt made mention of, of feeling guilty. And don't we feel guilty when we eat, when we overeat? <laughs> And uh, we actually also get sick. And so guilt will not drive us. We should remember that uh, God has, is grace, graceful and has, um, is kind to us. So in conclusion to this day, I would like for us to think that hunger is a sign of need, Right? Hunger is a sign of need. And have you ever guys on a road trip? Everyone on a road trip, right? And you're going on the freeway and, every, and you're hungry. And, and, and it's very proper, right, that there's billboards announcing you that food is coming, right? <clears throat> they have these signs of food in there with, uh, with an intention because they know that in a long road trip you will, get, you will be hungry. So hunger is a sign of need. So I would like for you to remember today, what is that sign of, of needing Jesus in your life? Is it that you're, not, you're getting upset more often? That's a sign of a need of, of, of being hunger for God. Or maybe you're not being patient enough. That's a sign of a need of, of, of hunger for God. Because there's an awareness of your own need to be patient or to not get upset. See, is that longing that should move you that I should not be okay with where I'm standing. It should move me to do something different. And see, some people are confident in their own righteousness, right? The Pharisees were like that. But Jesus didn't pronounce them blessed. The blessing does not belong to those who serve themselves and they think they are virtuous. The blessing is for those who see how far they have to go. Let's think that again. We have come a long way. We've made it. But you know what? There's still a long way to go. And that's what should drive us. That's what should take us to that constant need of God. To be constantly hungry for him. And yes, you feel satisfied in certain areas of your lives. But there's still those gaps in there that Jesus wants to fulfill. Second, hunger is a sign of life. We're all here because we are alive. 
And uh, you know that when you get home, or maybe on Sunday you don't have to go, oh, wait, today's Mother's Day, so maybe you'll take your mom to a restaurant and feed her and then feed yourself too. That's a sign of life. That's a sign of life. You see, I'm going to talk about babies again. Nobody teaches our children to be hungry, right? So I'll tell you a little bit about our second son. So um, I'm rather small in height, and uh, I had huge babies. Like my first baby was 10 pounds, <clears throat> and my second was 11 and a half. And my daughter was 10.2. So I've had huge babies. So um, when I had Daniel, um, the first one was a normal delivery. And uh, here I am talking about my personal stuff. Um, my second one um, made me suffer because I had dilated to 10 centimeters. And then he sat on my rib and had to have an emergency C-section. And... Uh, because he was 11 and a half pounds and there was no way that was gonna happen. <laughs> so, um, you know, I wasn't prepared for a C-section and as I'm laying there, you know, I'm almost dying, felt like my life was just in a thin thread. Um, my husband goes to the nursery with Daniel <clears throat> and they're all, you know, marveling about this amazing, beautiful child who needs to wear three months old clothes, right? <clears throat> And, uh, you know, my husband's seeing all the other babies and the nurses are trying for the kids to feed, you know, and kind of poking their edge of the mouth so they can open their mouths and they can be fed. Well, our son was a little bit different, and he chugged the bottle. And after one, he did another one. How many did he do, did, did, honey? He did three. See, they don't need mentoring on that. They don't, need a, uh, they don't need to go to seminary for that or to school for that. When there is life, there's hunger. And that child was hungry. Spurgeon says, to hunger after righteousness is a sign of spiritual life. Nobody who was spiritually dead ever did this. If you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you are spiritually alive. When the Spirit of God has changed our nature, that new nature hungers and thirsts after righteousness. The old nature never did, never could, and never would do so. So the flesh never hungers for righteousness. It's only after God's Spirit that we will be able to do that. Because if you hunger for righteousness, thank God for that. And the third one is that hunger is a sign of health. A healthy appetite is a good sign that a person eats well. But if a person loses his appetite, you start to get worried, right? You start to get concerned. So if a person is showing spiritual, um, spiritual unhealthy ways of, of being, then it means that we have to apply um, spiritual food to this person. And for them to grow a deep longing for Christ. For them to know that spiritual health is not to feel that you've arrived. It means that you have a longing for more. And that's what spiritual hunger is. See, the mark of a true Christian is that he never feels or she never feels that he has arrived or she has arrived to a righteous life. I've got it all together. I did my duty today. I helped my neighbor. I was good. I didn't get mad. This hunger should always compels us for more. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So see, all of us are involved in a quest for satisfaction. The question is, where will you find it? Who do you think is going to satisfy it? Whatever you think that that will satisfy it will become the greatest pursuit of your life. So... We're going to have to do a checkup today, right? When something is wrong or, when you, or you will go to your health, um, healthy, to your annual checkup, you go for a reason, right? But what about righteousness? How do we know we are, hurt, uh, we are uh, hungering and thirsting for this? You see, you don't find a lot of information or books that are written about this. 
Because sometimes as Christians today, what we are looking for is to have happy families and to grow healthy churches. But we forget that families are made up of human beings that should hunger and thirst for righteousness. The same goes for our churches. So as we um, take communion today, we want to be blessed. We want to walk in this time of being hungry and thirst. And isn't it amazing how the cup reminds us of a body that was broken and of blood that was shed? And these two items reminds us that we should be hungry and thirst for Jesus. The table is a reminder that the bread and the wine is a reminder of God's passion that he sent his son to die for us. You see, hungry, being hungry and being thirsty for righteousness should be made with love, should be done with love. And so as we uh, have our time with the, the communion in a few minutes, I would like for us to stand. And because I am a mom, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this, but I would like for you to repeat after me. And I would like to close your eyes and just think about this as you, as you say it to Jesus. Oh, God, I have tasted your goodness, and it has both satisfied me and made me thirsty for more. I am painfully conscious of my need of further grace. I am ashamed of my lack of desire for you. O oh God, the triune God, I want to want you. I long to be filled with longing. I thirst to be made more thirsty still. Show me your glory. I pray that I may know you. You indeed. Begin in mercy. A new work of love within me. Say to my soul. Rise up my love and come away. Then give me the grace. To rise. And follow you. Jesus, we desire to follow you. And we thank you for today. For your grace. For your goodness. Makes us, make us hungry and thirst for you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. And Kurt, I would invite you to... So... so uh, so we're going to be taking communion every week this month of May. And so uh, f this, uh, feel free during this next worship song to take your communion as you, um, in your own time. How's that? So we're going to begin to sing the next song. Everyone who is, fo wants to follow Jesus, you are welcome to participate with us. This is the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you.